Hard to believe that two years ago I bought this car from Green Bay, Wisconsin, drove it down to Texas, not knowing anything about EVs. A year later, about a year ago from today, I filmed a video right in the same spot. It was a little colder, but I think it was angled that way. And I did a one year review and that video came from a perspective of somebody who's just fairly new to EVs. I've had this car for two years now. And in this video, we're going to focus a lot on what's changed since the first year of ownership, infrastructure, dealership experience, wear and tear. This is a Kia, right? Everybody says they fall apart. So how's everything going with this car? Has my ownership experience been better? Do I regret it at this point? Am I itching to change? There's been a lot of competition that's come out in the last year or so. And that includes the EV6 GT, the EV9s come out, and we've got Polestars, we've got Volvos coming out with their recharge line. So a lot of cool stuff coming out. So is this still a compelling offer? We're gonna talk about that and a lot more in this video. I've made chapters down below, so feel free to scroll through. But really wanna thank everybody for their support of that first video, it did really well. And hopefully you find this video to be just as informative, if not even better, because I'm gonna be short and to the point for every single segment. So let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna start covering my 2022 Kia AV6. Let's go. Everybody's driving style with EVs is a little different. So what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of information about my EV, how many miles, things like that, but also what my driving habits are. And also just a little bit about not me, but about my other cars and kind of what my car taste is. So this is a 2022 Kia EV6 wind all wheel drive with the tech package. So it comes with some of the niceties that the GT line comes with, such as the 360 camera, the lane assist and all those kind of things. It doesn't have the interior lighting, which is still the one thing I miss. But I don't miss it enough to have to be like, oh, I should have bought a GT line thing. I don't really care about sunroof or anything like that. But that being said, this has 28,000 miles. We're just about to hit 28,000 miles on here. I would say we drive about 80% within the city and about 20% on the highway. We don't do a lot of road trips and we'll get into that later on in the video. And this car is used mostly for, by my wife. I, I drive it. I enjoy driving it. Uh, any car that she owns, I have to enjoy driving. That's why we won't own like a Traverse or anything like that because they bore the hell out of me. But I drive about 90% of the time in sport mode. My wife drives in normal. Uh, sometimes on the highway, we'll switch over to the eco mode, but it's so brutally slow to try to pass people. So a lot of times I just end up doing normal because we don't really take long road trips with this car. So I feel like it's important to kind of talk about some of the cars that I have right now in my household outside of the EV6. Because when you own an EV, I think you just kind of get generalized into this person who doesn't know about cars. Why would you switch to an EV? It's not even fun. They don't have the soul that a car does. And to some degree, I do agree. I like EVs. I think there's a really good place for EVs in the world. I also think there's a really good place for plug-in hybrids, which to me is a very sweet spot. So the EV6 is my third car. We have three cars in our household. I always have had a fun car, a fun daily driver for myself, and then a car that my wife and I both drive. In our situation, the EV6 is the third. It's my wife's car mainly. I drive it. She mostly drives it. She doesn't drive the other two cars. I come from a purchase history of about 32 cars uh, in the last 20 something years. And this is my first EV. However, I think it's important to mention the cars I have. So I have a 2005 B6 Audi S4. It's a Emola yellow with the Panda interior and it's a manual V8. I love, love that car. It's a maintenance nightmare but a whole lot of fun to drive and it sounds so magnificent. And I also have a 2018 E400 Mercedes wagon, which is my car. Now I replaced my Golf R with an Audi S4 and then a newer Audi S4. And then I got the Mercedes wagon, but at the end of the day, I have two ICE cars and one EV. So just because I have an EV doesn't mean that I'm all gung ho and I'm trying to save the world. I understand the pros and cons of EV development, but I also understand that this works for our lifestyle right now. I think it's okay to have an ICE car and an EV car. Get what works for you. And right now this works for us. Let's talk about the interior first. A lot of people make fun of Kia cars because they have really plasticky interiors. And yes, there are 
plenty of plastics in this car. However, to me, this still does not feel dated. I think the design's great. Everything seems to be wearing really well. For example, my steering wheel. Some people have complained about the stitching coming apart or even the silver trim coming apart. Mine looks perfect. In fact, mine doesn't even have any hand wear or fade or anything like that. Moving on to some of the seats. This is a vegan leather. The vegan leather is wearing really well. I sit a lot in the, the driver's seat. There's barely any creases and everything just looks really good with no stitching issues as well. The screens continue to be the highlight of the interior. They're still very big, very good resolution. They look up to date. I have the Screen Pro Tech screen protector on here, so I highly recommend getting that because it keeps everything super clean. This looks brand new. I've had it for a very long time. So check out that down below. The only thing I wish about the screens is that you could change the layout on the screen on the left, the one with the speed and everything, but you can't. Uh, it's very limited data that you can get on there, but not that big of a deal. When this car came out, a lot of people did not like the fact that you have to press this little button right here to switch from climate to media. And yes, it is still a little annoying, but I've gotten so used to it, it doesn't really bother me anymore. The other thing I like about the wind interior is that it has actual buttons to cool your seats or heat your seats and your steering wheel versus the GT line that actually has a gloss black kind of touch button. Where the cheap plastics do come into play is behind the seats. Now this is a pretty scratch prone area, so if you have kids, just get like a cover or something like I have in here. But in general, I will say that this interior is wearing very well. The doors look good. There's no excessive wear or marks or anything like that on the doors. And overall, just a nice interior with minimal gloss, at least on the wind trim. The electronics all work really well, no issues there. The window regulators, everything just works with one touch. Uh, have not had any concerns with any of the electronics in this car. On to the exterior. Now this car looks good. I still think it looks good. Of course that's subjective. But to me, this is still a really, really cool looking hatchback design. And because of the modifications I have, I do believe it looks pretty sleek and, and low. And I, I'm not going to lie, they still turn my head when I see some in public. So on the one year video, I focused a little bit on paint, that the paint is thin. The paint is thin, but I'll be honest, we are at 28,000 miles on this car now. And I haven't really seen much more degradation. We also don't really drive it outside of the city. Uh, we drive it on the highways around the DFW area but we don't really drive it on roads behind trucks or anything like that. So I haven't really seen a lot more wear and tear and nothing's going to change on the paint. If you are worried about your paint, just go ahead and get some PPF done. But the paint is what it is. I don't really see much more defects or anything like that. What about the plastic trim? Plastic trim seems to be fine. It's glossy for the most part and it stays clean. And I do a good job of de generally keeping this car clean. I just haven't lately, but it is all in good shape. There's no trim falling off. Now I've seen people have issues with the trim around the windshield and they've also had some of these wheel arches fall off. And I have not experienced any of that. As you can see, mine looks basically perfect. Like there's no, there's no issues with any of the plastic trim falling off. And also because it's glossy and not the plastic cladding that you see on many other cars, uh, it's, it's actually wearing pretty well. So one of the complaints that I've seen is headlights yellowing. I have not experienced any yellowing of the headlights. And I'm going to try to show you in the dark here what the headlights look like. So far, mine does not look very yellow. But as for the body panels, everything still looks like it lines up really well. There's no reason for me to be concerned about anything on this car, about things not lining up. But all the seams, all the lines seem to hold up. very very well and last but not least the charging port door no issues with this i used to kind of snap it closed like that but now because of my daughter calling it out i actually just use this button i still wish that there was uh, another light over here because in the dark it is kind of a pain in the butt to be able to see where you're plugging it in but no issues with the charging door it closes just fine and as you can see, I still have my black trim from a year ago from when I got my car taken to SEMA by m &S, So the black vinyl is still on and zero issues with the black vinyl. It looks really good still. So my general input would be this car still looks very good. It doesn't look dated. It doesn't look like it's going to look dated anytime soon because I've seen other cars come and go and they just kind of lose their appeal. 
but to me this still has very very nice lines and that's where i'm going to stick to i think this car still looks very very good So let's talk about my modifications. Now, some people might not consider everything on this list as a mod, but I do. But here's my interior and exterior list. You can pause it, you can look through it. But a lot of it is body kits, wheels, tires, interior protection, and a lot of small aesthetic things. I've also made a couple of videos that might help you. One is in my top five mods that I've done on my EV6, and one is just as an EV owner, what items you should be looking for. So one of the questions I get a lot is, what is the impact of these modifications on my range? And my short answer is I have not seen any impact to my range. If I have, it's negligible. I don't worry about it. Here's a picture of my family and I frolicking in a field because we're not worried about what the impact range of a mud flap is on my EV. So I'm just going to continue doing what I want because I don't expect a, any big hit on range or mileage or anything like that. As for future mods, I've done a lot of stuff to this car that I normally would do to any car outside of, you know, the obvious such as tuning or anything like that. Although there is a throttle controller apparently available for this car, which I'm not going to bother with. As of right now, I think the one thing that I do want to consider is upgrading the suspension to coilover kit, either Gecko or Neotech if I really want to spend some money. There's also an Instagram user who has installed KWV3s, which are apparently available now. So if you really want good suspension, KWV3 is the way to go. Otherwise, I might consider the strut bar. And then I've got some maintenance to do, such as caliper paint needs to be fixed and just minor things such as fixing the front lip that I destroyed. So let's shift gears over to maintenance costs and software updates. There's only a couple major issues with this car so far, and I'll talk about those in a separate section. But for this one, I want to focus on the daily cost or the normal cost of owning a car. I will say it's been a year, over a year, since I've been to the dealership, and the last time I went was because I had a 12-volt battery issue, and they went and fixed it and replaced the battery. I haven't had to go back to the dealership since. So it's really nice being able to just do my own tire rotations and the cabin air filter. Dealerships will charge you 30 to 60 bucks to install a cabin air filter. It takes about 15 seconds to install it after you order a 15 to 20 dollar part. I have a video, so if you're curious on how you install that, just do it yourself. It's super easy. As for wear and tear items, what's the total I've spent in almost two years? The only big things that I've replaced in the last two years are I just replaced the tires, which had 29K on them, and they got pretty bald. I drive pretty aggressively, but they were still very quiet and very grippy. So I figured, you know what, I'm going to keep these Kumo Krugen HP71. So we just reordered them and got some fresh new tires on my car at right around 29,000 miles. And the only other expense I've knowingly spent on this car is windshield wipers, which was about $25, $30. And I'm just now replacing those after two years of use. So overall, I think I've spent about $750 on this, including tires, in two years. Now, I do foresee some trips to the dealership coming up. We have an ICCU recall we're expecting, but also I'm seeing some low coolant. This is a closed coolant system, so I'm not sure why I'm running low on coolant, but that's something that I'm going to get looked at pretty quickly. As for the app, I technically count that as a maintenance cost because there is a monthly fee involved with it. Now, I paid for 18 months up front, so I don't have a monthly fee, but there is a monthly fee that honestly it just varies all the time. The app is fine. It's gone through a few design changes. It does the core functionality of what I need, which is setting charge limits, starting charging, starting climate, mostly is what I use it for. So is it worth it? I'm not sure. That really depends on you. I can't not have it because we use remote start all the time. I also use remote locate and 360 image all the time. So to me, it is worth it. I hate that we have to pay for it, but I do pay for it because I do use a lot of the features that are included with the Kia app. Is it going to be Tesla level? Probably not, but it gets the job done and it does it fine. And last but not least, software updates. There's only been a couple of big software updates in the last year or so, and they've mostly impacted the Maps app that comes factory on the car as well as the radio interface. Two things that I just unfortunately don't use. I use Android Auto and CarPlay and Google Maps. I don't use the factory navigation system, but that's apparently where a lot of the improvements have been made. So if you're using it, you'll find it beneficial because it helps you find chargers properly. I just continue to use Android Auto. Software updates are done the same way. You download it to your computer, you put it on a thumb drive, you put it on your car. A few hours later, it's installed, and that's really the process. 
So unfortunately, still no big clear answer on when OTAs will roll out for everything. I honestly don't think this generation will get that. So we'll probably never have that same experience as Tesla owners. However, I think that's gonna improve over the next few years. So let's quickly dive into the 12 volt battery. The 12 volt battery has been a hot topic on the Kia forums for probably a few months now. A lot of the posts are about the 12 volt battery dying, usually at the worst times possible, and or your orange light of death being on. This is what that light looks like. Now keep in mind, this light does not mean necessarily anything bad. This light just indicates that the smaller battery, the 12 volt battery, is being charged by the bigger battery. That's all it means. Now, if you start seeing this on all the time, there could be some kind of an issue, but it also could mean that you're about to deal with the same 12 volt battery issue that a lot of people have dealt with. Now, here's some of the symptoms. Another dead battery, same day as earlier. And the mirrors are out. Screen's completely dead. Turns on, screen dies. What's the fix you might ask? There really isn't a perfect fix right now. However, people have found ways to mitigate this. As of right now, you could take it back to the dealership and you could try to get them to cover it under warranty. Likely they replace it with the same battery. People have had the same issues over and over. Other people have replaced it with higher output batteries. Now I actually replaced it with an AGM battery that I got from Walmart for $180. It was out of my pocket. I just wanted the peace of mind. So I just went and did it. You don't have to. Uh, other people have also upgraded over to maybe like an OMU battery, which has a built-in Bluetooth monitor to help you monitor when the car is charging. If you're wanting a completely trouble-free kind of experience with the EV6, right now this is one of the issues plaguing the car. And I agree, it is very stupid and Kia is taking their very sweet time to try to fix this issue. Twelve volt battery issues aside, which really is the only big problem I've had with this vehicle in over two years, I wanna talk a little bit about my range. I mostly drive in the city, and when I drive mostly in the city, I get about 240 to 250, even sometimes 260, 270, if I'm driving a little conservatively. Now keep in mind, I drive in sport probably 90% of the time, and my wife drives in normal, we never drive in eco, and we usually leave regen on around two or three. On the highways, on the other hand, you do get worse range, as is typical with EVs, and we usually get around 200 to 220 miles. Now, if you're really booking it, you'll probably get 180 to 200. These numbers may sound very, very low. So this could be worst case scenario for some people. Home charging is very important. I highly recommend to anybody who has an EV to get a home level two charger. It's an upfront investment. It cost me about $800 to get the port installed in my garage. So the charger that I use at home, I have a wall box and I also have the Electron. Both of these do the job really well. I actually end up using the Electron a little bit more because it has a screen that shows me the voltage transfer rate. The wall box, however, has some insanely good smart features. So if that's what you're looking for, I would recommend the wall box or maybe even the Emporia as seen here. Just make sure they're UL certified and they're from a good brand because you do not want a fire in your house. On a level two, my car basically goes from 20 to 80% in about six, seven hours or so. So I usually plug it in at night, maybe around nine or 10 at night. So when I wake up, my car is fully charged. As for charging to 100, everybody says don't do it. I do it every now and then, maybe once or twice a month, I'll charge to 100. The rest of the time I charge to 80%. So what about public charging? How's that evolved in the last two years? In all honesty, I've seen it get a little bit better. I've seen Electrify Americas open up, but in the DFW market where I live, Dallas, Fort Worth, it still kind of is hit or miss. There's a lot of Tesla charges, which we'll talk about in a second. I don't use public chargers that much, so I can't comment on them as much. Route planning has also gotten better. The Kia software itself has gotten a lot better. I don't frankly use it. I use Android Auto or CarPlay most of the time, but from what I understand, the route planning in the Kia app on the car itself has gotten a lot better. Otherwise, there's apps like a better route planner. You can also use the apps that come with the manufacturer of the chargers, such as Electrify America, which I've used quite a bit, and so on. I would encourage you to check out your public infrastructure around you if you think you're going to rely on it. Otherwise, get a level two charger at home and you'll be good to go. If you plan on doing a lot of road trips, just map some of the trips that you think you're going to do out.
So as of right now, Rivian and Ford have actually completely adapted to Tesla's charger. In fact, if you're a Ford or a Rivian owner, you actually get a Tesla adapter for free from them. And you can go to any Tesla charger, plug your car in and you're good to go. With the EV6, right now, you have to go to a magic dock, which is specific sections of a Tesla charging station that aren't everywhere yet. But those magic docks do have special adapters built into them that you can plug into the EV6 and you can charge the EV6. So you can't just pull up to any Tesla supercharger. You have to pull up to the one that has a magic dock. So that's something that you need to look for. We do have the capability of charging at level one and two Tesla chargers, such as at hotels and things like that, as long as you have the Tesla 2 CCS adapter. I've done many reviews on these, so check those out if you get a chance. As for the future, it looks like Tesla's charger is becoming the standard. So we should see basically every auto manufacturer adapting and putting the Tesla chargers in as the main hardware in the cars themselves. So you don't need any adapters. I believe we start seeing that in 2026. So this problem should get better as long as the infrastructure keeps on growing. So there's not lines and lines of people waiting to get power. Moving on to a section that most people want to hear about, issues slash quirks. 12 volt battery. I've already covered this. I've already talked about how I replaced it. So it's just something to be aware of. Do your research. If you have any questions, ask away, join a forum. There's plenty to be discussed about the 12 volt battery. On that same note, the ICCU issue is also becoming a big deal. This is where your car actually just stops charging with certain chargers and then eventually it just stops charging period. And when I say charging, I mean the big battery. So people are plugging their cars when they get home and finding out that their ICCU is not working and all of a sudden they can't even charge the car so they're getting it towed. Some cases you're waiting weeks to get the part. So if you're lucky, the dealership can get the part pretty fast and they'll replace it. But it is a well-known issue. It's even an issue on the Ionic 5 because there's actually a recall already out for the ICCU on the Ionic 5. And as of April 29th, which is when I'm filming this, we are expecting to get an ICCU recall for the Kia EV6, in fact, this week. This car does have coolant in it, and the coolant actually cools from what I understand the high voltage battery. So if you look in the front of the car, you'll actually see this pink fluid in this reservoir on the left of the front. And that's actually where the coolant goes, just like you would see on an ice car. So the other day I checked it and mine was fairly low. So I just made a video on topping it off. So you can check that out. Here you'll see the location of the rear vents. Yeah, they're in the door where a lot of other cars have them, but they suck. They don't blow very strong. Would have been nice if they put something here, anything really. Could have put some vents in there or something, but. Moving on to a couple other things such as the Kia app. Now the app has actually gotten a little bit better. The functionality generally has remained the same, but they have made it look better and respond a little faster. Sometimes the app is just down and it's really obnoxious. It just happens when I'm actually trying to start my car or trying to take a 360 photo or anything like that. The app just happens to be down. Now it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. And it's just something to note. And as for the mediocre sound quality that I always complained about, there is a few settings that you can mess around with. So if you go into sound here, you can go to Meridian Horizon Custom and change the imaging and the immersion. So there is some level of customization, but my solution has always been power amp. Now I think iPhone users might be a little out of luck where you have to use a different equalizer, but on Android users, power amp is the best if you want you can check out my video on power amp i kind of focused a little bit on how to use it what to do with it keeping in mind that most of the bass still continues to come from these front speakers and the subwoofer still lacks and the rear speakers are almost a joke there is the subwoofer in the trunk that's it that's all you get this tiny little sub and last but not least is the dealership experience now I've been to the dealership maybe once since my last one year video, and the experience was fine. I think things are getting better with the Kia dealers knowing about the EV6. Now it's been a couple of years, so I hope they would know a little bit more about it. 
But at the end of the day, there's still a lot of things that pop up that the dealership's like, we need to call somebody from Kia and to look at it. So just keep that in mind. The dealerships have gotten nicer, especially the ones around me. Aesthetically, they've made them look a little prettier. So you're not walking into a ghetto old Kia dealership. However, the maintenance experience could be a hit or miss. Some dealers will just sit on a car and not call you back. And some will actually respond very quickly. So it's very inconsistent. And I know that happens with other manufacturers as well. But when you're paying $60,000 for a brand that is trying to become a little bit more premium, you would expect them to kind of keep that consistency or push that consistency. Moving on to my favorite section and something a little bit more positive, which is the unsung heroes and underappreciated items. Some of these things apply to EVs in general, but some of these things do apply to having an EV6 or a car in the EGMP platform. These are things that I don't think I thought about before I bought the EV6 or even just switched over to electric. These are just items that I think I would miss if I switched back to an ICE car. So let's talk about these real quick. Number one, remote starting in the garage. I never have to open the garage to remote start this car. I can actually just do it through the app. I can do it with the, my fob and I never have to worry about any fumes, any noises or anything like that. And it just is warm or cold when I get in the garage. Number two, especially in cold climates, you can just get in and go. You don't have to sit there and wait for the engine to kind of warm up. You don't have to let it get to any kind of operating temperature or idle need to drop. I just get in, start the car and go. It honestly becomes a luxury to never have to wait for your car to come to temperature and you just go, you just get in and go. Number three, not waking up the neighborhood. Now, a lot of car enthusiasts, that's just something they pride themselves on as being the a-hole in the neighborhood who wakes up the whole neighborhood because you want to show off your cool exhaust. So it's just a really nice way of going in and out of your neighborhood without worrying about any noises. Another big one, and this is EV6 slash Ionic 5 Hyundai Kia related, is the parking assist where you can actually use your remote to pull the car back or forward. When I heard about this, I was like, what a stupid party trick. And you always saw it being used in a parking lot and you're like, okay, I'm never gonna use this in public. However, I find myself using this all the time in my garage. My garage is not that wide, and when I have two cars in there, I constantly have things around the garage, car parts, tires, boxes of things, and sometimes it becomes a really tight squeeze to get in and out of there. So I'll just take 10 to 15 seconds of my day, and I'll actually use a key fob to pull the car out. This has become such a normal thing for me that not having it kind of sucks. It's just a really cool use for a feature that I thought was just going to be kind of like a novelty. Another unsung hero for me in this car is the paddle shifter looking regen button. So I'm talking about these little paddles right here that control how much regen you have. So right now I'm on level three. Let's say I want to go to level two. I just press the right paddle and it goes to level two, level one, level zero. So now I'm just coasting, gliding, whatever you want to call it. But let's say I want to go to I pedal. I just tap this four times and it goes down. So it's just such a cool intuitive experience. I didn't really even notice how cool this feature is until I drove an EV that didn't have it and you have to do other methods of changing the brake regen. And it's something that I think people who've driven Kia and Hyundai would miss if they switched cars. Another kind of a cool party trick was that V2L adapter. So the V2L adapter basically plugs into your charging port and it gives you a 110 outlet and you can now use your car basically as a generator for power. Now, the cool thing about this is that lots of people reported using this during power outages to power up their fridge. In fact, there's videos out there that basically enable this car to run major appliances in your house if you have a power outage. To show it off, I actually made a video a few months ago where I just took my whole gaming rig and we went to a random construction site and we filmed ourselves using the V2L to power up my whole sim rig, my beginner sim rig, I should say. This is already, uh more technologically advanced than my home But I do think it could help a lot of people in a power outage, especially if you live in an area where there are storms and things like that. So just something to keep in mind, the V2L is a really cool feature. And last but not least is the torque. 
I understand that maybe 90% of the population thinks that EVs have no soul. I get it. EVs aren't generally the most engaging cars in the world as of right now. Now this car does a respectable 4.5, 4.6 second zero to 60. Of course you have the GT, you're doing, you know, about three seconds zero to 60s. And that torque is just so nice. And just driving around with all that torque available at all the time with no shifting, no mechanical things moving around. Yes, you miss some of that if you're looking for a performance car, but as a daily driver, you just can't ask for anything better. I think at this point, I will always have an EV as a daily driver because the experience is just so nice and seamless. So those are some of the unsung heroes that I feel like people don't really talk about with the EVs or even with the EV6. let's talk quickly about the trims that are available for the EV6. I've said repeatedly that I recommend at least any of the all-wheel drive variants. Yes, the rear-wheel drive will give you slightly higher mileage and range. If you think the rear-wheel drive torque is enough, more power to you. I definitely think that the all-wheel drive is really where it's at. And I recommend at least getting the wind with tech package because it does give you some of the nice things from the GT line. But let's talk about the EV6 GT. So why have I not, being a car enthusiast, switched over to the EV6 GT? Well, a couple of reasons. A, when they came out, they were too expensive. However, that's been negated because now you can actually leave a dealership and get one of these for somewhere in the 40s. And if you can get one used, you can definitely get it in the low 40s, which is honestly an insanely low amount of money for how much car you get. But that's not the reason. The other big reason is, is the fact that the seats are not power and they also don't have cooled seats. Now that might sound like such a privileged thing to complain about, but me and my wife switched this car back and forth. We have very different body shapes and sizes and we're constantly going from memory one to memory two. So not having that, we would constantly be adjusting these seats. And then we also live in Texas where we actually use the cooled seats all the time. Bottom line is, I don't think I'm ready to give up some of the features that we use a lot. Next up is the EV9. The EV9 is what I would consider a very polarizing three row EV. We actually want to switch over to a small three row SUV and our options likely would be like the Ford Explorer or the Kia Sorento actually has a third row. The MDX has a small third row. So there's other cars that are out there, but my biggest deterrent for the EV9 is the price. I simply cannot justify spending 70K for the trim that I want on the EV9 or even 65, 68K. So the big question as we wrap up, should you get the EV6? Well, there's a couple of factors that I wanna make sure we talk about, which is Kelly Blue Book values. The value of this car and many other EVs has tanked. You can thank that in part to Tesla prices dropping, but also the EV market has softened up. I think there was too much of a push for EVs and people are pulling back. So EVs are not selling as much, they're still selling, but the demand has definitely softened up. And number two, a lot of people still don't have very good confidence on what a used EV entails. You know, do you get the warranty with it if you're a second owner? Is the battery gonna need to be replaced? So you just see that market softening up quite a bit. So these cars have actually taken a pretty big hit. So those of us that paid MSRP, or in some cases even more than MSRP when the car first came out, are sitting pretty upside down. So hopefully not everybody's in that situation, but it's definitely something to be aware of. However, on the positive side of that, if you're just in the market for an EV6 now, you can get these for a, a hell of a deal. I'm talking 15 to $20,000 less than what people paid brand new, in some cases even more than that. So if you're in the market for an EV6, right now is a really good time to buy outside of really crappy interest rates. Another thing to consider, of course, is competition. There's a lot of cars that have come out or are out and have been refined over the last couple of years. Cadillacs entered the market. We've got Polestars. We've got Mustang Mach-E's, Volkswagen stepping it up. We've got Acura coming in with a ZDX. So would the EV6 stick out from this? Now, I see a lot of people not buying the EV6 because of the stigma behind the Kia name or the Hyundai name or anything like that. If that's your reason, then, you know, there's nothing I can do to convince you otherwise because you're just going to be brand conscious. But between all the cars that I've listed, I still highly recommend the EV6. Last couple things to consider before you think about buying an EV6 is your driving needs. I've been very transparent about what kind of miles I get, what kind of range I get. If you think you're going to be road tripping a lot in the future, I think it'll get better. But right now, maybe a Tesla is a better option for you. If you live in an apartment and you don't have access to a charger, maybe don't consider an EV. 
if you want something unique, the EV6 is for you. If you want something that kind of just blends in, get the ID4. So after all of that, would I still recommend the EV6 or really even an EV as a car? So I can't tell you the right answer to that because you know your driving habits. My goal with this video was to teach you what I've learned over the last two years. So hopefully it gives you an idea of what EV ownership, but also EV6 ownership has been like. Now, I know that there's a lot of people that will immediately write this off because there's 12 volt battery issues or things like that. That's bound to happen, but you're in a good spot to where a lot of the stuff is being worked out. So if you're in the market now, this is definitely something I would look for because they are fixing some of the major issues that we found as early adopters. So I continue to stress that the EV6 is a really good option, especially if you're in the EV market, because it still looks good. It still has really good tech. The updates are coming as Kia decides to release them. So getting a little bit better. The infrastructure is getting a little bit better. And seriously, these prices are pretty ridiculous. The prices that you can get on MSRP, off of MSRP, I should say, and the lease deals are so good, especially for the GT trim. A lot of people are walking away with GTs because the lease deals are so good. So check out almost all of the EGMP platform cars, Ionic 5 and the uh, EV6. We've got the Ionic 6, which I'm not a fan of physically, but really good lease deals. So it could get you into an electric vehicle for cheap and figure out if that's something you really think you can live with because i do think that as a secondary car if you have a nice car right now i would definitely consider an ev because they are easy to drive you just get it and go and they're still fun to drive because of all the torque if you are looking for an ev as your main vehicle obviously just do your homework learn what's the infrastructure around you what your driving habits are going to be i still think the ev6 is a very compelling offer as a self-claimed gearhead to some degree, from this point on, we're probably always gonna have an EV in the household. Is it gonna be my main car? Probably not, because I do think the everyday living with an EV is super, super nice and super easy. So that is my thoughts after two years. I thank everybody who's watching this video sincerely for all the support, and hopefully this teaches you a few things. So thanks everybody, like, subscribe, all those things. We'll see you next time, bye.